All right, we're going to do our best to give you new information and educate you on the issues related to augmented reality and the law. So I'd like to start by just doing very quick intros, but I want to start at the far end, and I'll tell you more about what I do at the end. So Ed, take, take it away. Do a little intro. And the mic is right here. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I'm Ed Claris. Uh, I started a firm called Claris Law. After having spent some time in-house and at other firms, I teach law also at Columbia Law School. Uh, many of our clients are in the VR and AR space, uh, both in the technology side and avatar building and such like that, and platforms, uh, distribution uh, platforms. So I'm looking forward to talking to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexia. I work with Ed at Claris Law. I'm an associate there. I trained in the UK, and my love for the AR VR space um, started the first time that I tried Fruit Ninja in VR, which I had a terrible obsession with when it wasn't in VR. So that's when I thought this is a cool space. Hi, everyone. I'm Kimberly Culp. I'm a counsel at Venable in the San Francisco office. Uh, my clients are mostly in the video game space, although they're obviously in AR and VR and moving into AR and VR. And um, so my practice is and has been as well. I'm Brian Wassum. I uh, work at uh, Warner Norcross and Judd and partner there. It's a law firm, full service law firm based out of Michigan. I've been, uh, I grew up as a, a media IP commercial litigation and, and uh, pre-litigation counseling attorney. Um, been in love with this space for a long time. This is my eighth consecutive AWE. Um, so I've, I've got the fortune to represent a good number of the folks here. And um, I've always had a love for the space. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Leventhal. I am a partner at Holmes Weinberg. It's a boutique in Los Angeles. I have been in the digital media space for 25 years, uh, mostly in private practice. I do a lot of work as outside general counsel and kind of uh, do a lot of intellectual property and corporate work for clients on the transactional side. Um, most of my time has been spent in the, um, uh, sorry, I'm getting a call, which I'm Turning away. Uh, most of my time has been spent uh, in uh, in private practice, but I did do a three-year stint as a vice president at Magic Leap, and uh, so that that kind of informs some of my views. I've been in the in the uh, AR VR space uh, since about 2011. So I'm Philip Lollyveld. I run the Immersive Media Initiative at the Entertainment Technology Center at USC's uh, School of Cinematic Arts. We're futurists and XR is so this year. So it's immersive media. Um, we're doing a number of projects. Uh, we're entirely sponsored by the CTOs of the six Hollywood studios plus other companies to advise them on the future of entertainment. So if you think about theme parks as retail spaces with an entertainment overlay. You usually exit a ride through the gift shop. What happens if you think about a city or a town as a retail and social infrastructure? What happens if you want to do an entertainment overlay on that? So let's get into the whole topic of uh, AR and the law in public and private spaces. And let's just start off by defining uh, what uh, um, I'm sorry, intellectual property is. So Kimberly, 30 seconds. Sure, so I have 30 seconds to tell you what took many of us many years to learn in law school and then decades to practice about, so go. Um, it, real property, you own your house, you own your land. Intellectual property, think about it as the things that you own that you've created from your mind. So the three classics are your patents, your inventions, copyrights, works of authorship. Um, for this group, really think about your avatars, your creative content, your software, and then uh, your trademarks, the things that you do to identify yourself to your consumer, to the, to the marketplace. I would add to that traditional three, uh, your secrets, which are your trade secrets. It's the opposite side of the invention coin if you don't tell the public what your invention is, you hold it, you keep it secret. I would still argue that that's part of your intellectual property that you own when you're thinking about your IP assets. So Kimberly, when you're working with a company that's developing AR or VR assets or experiences, what are the issues they need to think about to protect their IP? Well, so first and foremost, uh, I advise my clients to take an audit of what they think their IP is and have a strategy for protecting it. I will tell you that not all clients choose to 
um, registered all of the things that could be registered as a trademark to patent everything that might be an invention. Uh, not every road is traveled down, but take an audit of what you think you have and understand what your strategies are to protect those aspects of your intellectual property. Um, from there, I would also say take an audit of um, what's outside of your company. And um, I have three big buckets that I would think about who are your competitors? What are they doing? You know, how are you different from them? What are what is your buffer between your IP and their IP? What does their strategy look like? Might it intersect and really ha have plans for protecting your company and what you might do in different circumstances? Think about the government, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but who's paying attention to your business from the government's perspective and how might they think about uh, your business, and then you know the uh, the third bucket it would be your consumers and the public, and what do they think about your business? And pay attention to how they're talking about it, and um, you know pay attention to those forums where they say positive and negative things, and and follow that f feedback as well. Beautiful. So Michael, you're on the other side of the equation quite often. You're looking to license IP from other people. What is it that you try to get your clients? What rights are you trying to get versus what they get to keep? So this gets to be uh, this can be a tricky area if you're if you're going to traditional media. Um, and by the way, the reason my phone is on my is on the table here is because I'm cheating off of a blog post that I wrote uh, last fall for this. But uh, so basically, if if you want to use uh, intellectual property of a, like a brand or, a, or a, a, some sort of a project that everybody knows, uh, for example, Exorcist or something like that. You've got to get the license, you've got to license the rights from the holder. And uh, those folks, and especially still in, in, in where we are in the world right now, the people inside of traditional media companies are very nervous about what kind of rights they're giving up. They, they want to, they know they have to give up some kind of electronic rights, but they don't necessarily know what those are, and they're afraid that if they license you the electronic rights you need in order to do your job, they're gonna have given up OTT rights, and suddenly they don't, you've got the rights to uh, display their, their, their IP on Netflix, and they don't anymore. So you have to, you have to be really careful to give them, you know, to take what you need and, and, and leave the rest. So, um, and it's tricky to do this because because this area, the the rights you want, it's not as simple as like, well, you want movie rights. You know, everybody knows what movie rights are. But here, the, you you have a platform and you've got a medium and you've, you've got a, a channel of distribution. And it's hard to tell, you know, which is which. Is is you know, Samsung Gear is that a channel? of distribution or is it a platform that you're on? So how do you define these? And the way that I kind of cracked that nut at, at one point was I, I, I kind of listed the various areas in which we would need rights. And so for the first was distribution systems. So digital distribution systems like the iTunes store or Steam or things like that, the Sony PlayStation store, that like if you, to sell in there. Uh, then I, I broke it out into higher interactivity VR um, platforms such as the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive. Then you've got the lower interactivity uh, VR platforms like the kind of the um, the gear and the Google Cardboard and things such as that, where they are VR but they don't do as many things. And those are different experiences. You'll be you know creating different experiences for for each of those. Then I dove into mixed reality, augmented reality, and talked about, you know, kind of listed HoloLens and Magic Leap and ODG and Meta and kind of all of those areas. Um, and then kind of, then we do a few other things. I did uh, other VR capable platforms like Nintendo Switch and, you know, you just kind of, you're listing everything you can think of. Um, I was very fortunate to put location-based media, media-aided reality experiences or XR experiences into the list. Uh, because when I did this one, um, a, a, a location-based entertainment company came back to my client later and said, we want to license that right, and there it was in the contract. So that was a good day. Um, and then finally, you'd always do the catch-all, and my catch-all was any other distribution channel or platform similarly capable of supporting or distributing VR, AR, or MR content now known or hereafter devised. So you just do, you know, and they signed it, so uh, so we were all good. But it, it's it's complicated, and and of course the problem with this this definition really worked last year, and it will need updating 
regularly because the technology continues to change. So you, you've mentioned a whole lot of interesting things, and let me ask the whole panel a question. You can dive for a mic if you've got an answer. What happens if you're trying to license IP that has had a crowdsource component that the public has contributed information to it? Um, does that matter? Uh, does anyone, how would you handle that? I'd want to know what the uh, terms of service were on the contribution. I think that's going to be, that's going to be heavily determinative of what rights you can get, is what rights does the company you're licensing it from have in, in the first place. Ed, did you have anything different? Oh, sorry. Uh, I guess um, I was just going to say that, you know, first of all, any software licensing inevitably includes open source licensing. So anybody who thinks that they're somehow licensing somebody else's completely proprietary software is just not the case. Um, and therefore, you have to be able to look at the license terms under um, the given piece of software that you that is included. And there has to be a, an inventory of the elements of what's in the um, package so that one knows what, what, what they're licensing and what they therefore can do with the underlying work. Mm -hmm. Brian, do you have anything? All done? Okay. So, so um, Alexia and uh, Ed, moving into sort of public spaces, you've done a lot of work with museums. Um, what are the risks of, of uh, AR experiences in museums, in, well, specifically? So, any New Yorkers here? Yep. Wow, okay. One. Was that One. A no? <laughs> One. So, at the MoMA right now, I think it's still running, there's in the Jackson Pollock room, there was an AR takeover. And what they did is they did AR experiences of all of the paintings in that room. So there's a number of things to think about if you're an AR creator and you're going to do that. One is, is the artist still alive? Because if the artist is still alive, there's an act out there which is called the Visual Artist Rights Act, which protects artists from, dist essentially, from distortions of their work. And the real question there is going to be, and this hasn't been tested yet, whether augmentations of an artist's work, if they're damaging of the artist's reputation or the artwork in any way, are those the kind of things that Vera had in mind? If an artist is no longer alive, Vera doesn't apply anymore. So that's the first thing. If the artist is dead, you can cross Vera off your list of worries. The second thing to think about is copyright and the date of the artwork. If the artwork predates 1923, it's in the public domain. Chances are you can go ahead and do any kind of augmentations you want without having any issues. If the artist is, if the work um, postdates 1923 and is subject to copyright, then you have copyright issues, right? The question becomes, is the augmentation of, what, of the piece of work a derivative work? And the question there will become whether what you're doing is a fair use, right? Are you commenting in some way on the artist's work? Are you adding a new meaning? Are you offering it in a new light? And um, augmentations like uh, at the MoMA, which really there the artist said that what they were trying to do was it was sending a message. They want to democratize museums. They were commenting on what does it really mean to say that a museum is open to the public? Something like that that is being done with a message is probably more likely to be a fair use than if the museum is commissioning augmentations and not paying the artist. So to recap, things to think about are if the artist is alive, Vera, if the work post-dates 1923 copyright, and if it does, is whether you're doing um, a fair use or not. So those would be the main ones to think about. And th this is where these are such fun issues for us, anyway, to, to noodle. They're, they're excruciating for you because there's no, no uh, definitive answer. But the, the, these, are, these are the types of issues where, like Alexia said, some of these core issues haven't been tested. See, now, I, 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 would, I would argue the flip side of that, uh, um, of that issue, in a lot of cases, it really, it's really going to depend on the facts, and I'll show you how. Um, because whether you're talking a VAR analysis or a copyright analysis, it, the, the first question is, are you doing anything at all to the work? Um, and in a lot of cases, you will be. But simply superimposing a digital display on top of a physical artwork, I would argue, is not doing anything to the artwork at all. Right? You haven't changed 
the artwork. You haven't made a derivative of it because the original is still there. Uh, you, haven't, you haven't altered the artwork in any way. Um, you're, you're, you're creating the perception that there's something on top of it, but that, that digital stuff, that digital layer exists independently uh, of, of the artwork itself. So I would, be, I would be a little bit more skeptical of an infringement claim. That said, in order to get there, um, the, the question becomes, well, have you just used a point cloud of different, um, different dots on the artwork to recognize it? Or have you actually reproduced that artwork digitally in order to then create the augmentation. If, if you've done the latter, well now, you, now you've done something different. You've, you've not only created derivative work of it, but you've also reproduced the work, which are two no-nos under the Copyright Act. So um, the, the, there, are, there are ways to avoid exposure to these uh, issues, exposure to these sorts of infringement issues, if you think through them ahead of time, even when you're designing your app. Yeah, and you might be, so just to add on that, one of the things you might be doing there, if you're not just doing the overlay, but you're allowing, which a lot of AR experiences allow you to do, which is actually take a snapshot of it or film it, and then you are actually allowing through your experience people to capture it, then you're probably, I think, getting into more murky waters of whether you're infringing someone's copyright or not. Do these issues come up regardless of whether it's a public or private museum, or does that introduce new factors? It really doesn't matter. Um, the the terms of the conditions of use in a public museum can be the same as the conditions of use of a private museum. They invite you in under certain conditions that do or do not permit certain behavior. And it's not as though you're on a public street walking uh, with a certain amount of authority without anybody having to give you the permission. A, pu a public museum is allowed to close at six o'clock and is allowed to tell you that you can't have dogs running around and, and can tell you that you can't use VR or AR. Mm -hmm. So let's get into uh, trespass in public spaces and, and Brian's case, because Brian litigated um, the Candy Lab uh, case in, in Milwaukee, which was, it's like Pokemon, only the city objected to playing it in a public park, right? right? And what was your take on it, and what was the result? Well, I think, I think panel discussions are always more fun when we kind of try different sides of, of different issues. And so um, it, was a, it was a great segue when you, when you talk about being the, the, the public entity telling you what you're allowed to and not allowed to do and using AR in, um, in public settings. That was the, the, the basis of, of this lawsuit as well. So um, this all stems uh, out of Pokemon Go. And so uh, at, right after, this is in July 2016, um, after the app comes out, um, there are, you know, public parks are, are overflowed with, with players. Most, most local municipalities handled it in uh, the way they should. If, if people were loitering, they ticketed people for loitering. If people trampled the daisies, they ticketed you for trampling the daisies. Uh, one county supervisor uh, in Milwaukee County, which apparently exists, um, decided that he was gonna be clever and, and, and go one step better. And he, he says, well, I'm gonna solve this problem not by passing a new ordinance that regulates people playing these games. I'm gonna pass an ordinance that regulates the companies that publish the games. Uh, and, and the way that it's written, the ordinance was written can, shows that he didn't really think through what he was actually doing. Um, but it was written to say, if, you, if a company introduces a location-based augmented reality game into one of our parks, uh, you need a license. And from, from there, you're, you're already, you already have some cognitive dissonance because nobody introduces anything into the park. The, public, the, the company publishes an app. It goes into the app store. Users download it onto their phones. Um, that what he's trying to say is when you put augmented reality content location based that can be interacted with in our county parks. Uh, but he didn't, nobody put anything into the park because um, like we, we talked about earlier today, the, the, the definition of, of augmented content is that it appears to be physical. It appears to be something that you interact with in three dimensions but it's not really there. That, 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 that to me is, is the line that I've found myself repeating for years in a lot of these uh, analytical discussions about augmented reality and how the law can, can, uh, can regulate it because everybody wants to treat it like it's really physical, like it's really out there, but it's not really there. It is an illusion. It still exists in two dimensions on your phone, just portrayed in a particular way that tricks the eye. Um, 
So I saw this bill passing through the, the, the legislature there, and, and on one hand, I thought, oh, this would be terrible if somebody passed a law like this. And the other hand, I'm thinking, oh, dear God, please pass this, because I, I want to sue this county, and, and sure enough. Um, so, and, and out of conversations with a lot of folks here, uh, a lot of folks were, were, were justifiably outraged by it, but you know, weren't in a position to do anything about it. But um, fortunately, uh, Andrew Couch at Candy Lab, uh, who you'll, you'll meet here on, on the expo floor, he, um, he was both. He was, he was, he was uh, upset about it and wanted to do something about it. And it, they, it, as it happened, had just published a game called Texas Hold, or Texas Rope'em, rather. It was an AR version of, of the Texas Hold'em poker game. And so very, very much Pokemon-esque in, in, in its function uh, and fell under the definition of this statute. So he had, uh, he had standing. We made sure he dropped a, a, a geode tag in, in, in a Milwaukee park Park just to make sure he had standing to, to, to file to challenge this lawsuit and we and this ordinance and we did we filed a First Amendment lawsuit in uh, the federal court there in Wisconsin and uh, the the court agreed with us uh, in uh, July of that year July of last year we we got a great great opinion from the judge um, striking down the ordinance as a violation of the First Amendment because a public entity like the county. Um, can't regulate speech, and so that's what what it boiled down to is that uh, the, the 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 law wasn't regulating use of the park of things in the park. The the statute that it shoehorned this new ordinance into was the same one that it used to regulate weddings and and you know soccer games that you would want to physically invade the park, but it required a thousand dollar entry fee, a, a, a plan for how you're going to pay for bathrooms, security, litter uh, control. So it makes no sense applied to a mobile app. Um, so the, the, just the, just the the asininity of it was was something that the the, the court took took note of, said this is really shoving a, it's like burning down the house to roast the pig, uh, which is a quote from a first, another First Amendment case. So um, for that reason, I could go on, and obviously I'm inclined to, but I'll shut up and let the rest of the panel speak. Well, I, I want to move over to Edna Alexia. So that's a public park. Can a homeowner do anything to prevent you from putting your characters into their yard? Homeowners have a right to prevent the speech coming from their property, right? Which is interesting here in this country. You have a right about what you say, but you also have a right to stay silent. So at that point, it really becomes a balancing exercise between the right of the app developer to speak and to place their markers and your app to not speak from your property, to not have what if somebody places a marker for an offensive message or something which is completely counter to what you believe in and your your, your thoughts, and so you have an ability to prevent that, but at that point, it really becomes a balancing exercise between that, your right to stay silent versus somebody else's right to speak. Michael? So uh, all, all that is true, and we've been focusing on the uh, freedom of speech aspect of this, but I think there's also potentially a property aspect of this, which is, um, you know, what is the nature of, of your ownership of your home? Do you have control over, um, over the virtual space that is superimposed over your physical space? Can some other company or entity place tags or place kind of virtual characters in a space that corresponds with your front yard, um, so that you know, for everyone, can we can can you dot something in the AR cloud that is discoverable there? It, it will cause people to you know trample your daisies and all of that sort of thing. But what you know, I, I think this is a, this is a question we don't know the answer to yet. We don't know what people are going to say about that. But. There are um, right. there there are similar kinds of situations that have happened over time, like. Um, Boom mics and tele and uh, zoom lenses were historically used by uh, the aggressive news media to capture what what's being said on a person's property or what's being done in somebody's home if the zoom lens can get into the window. And uh, the question has arisen, and you know, California's I think I think it's still the only state that has a, a, a no zoom lens into your private property law. But every other state, you know, if you can see in with some uh, technology, then you can see in with that technology and close your shades if you're doing something private. Um, similar, certainly you can't walk onto somebody's property and find something. You can't, you can't trespass, but, you know, these 
projecting things is not necessary. I don't. I can't think of a single law unless there's there. I'm missing something that that would prohibit. Yeah, I I, I feel strongly, and there's there's respectful dis, uh, dis, distance in views and in different perspectives here. But uh, I, I feel strongly that there is no right, no First Amendment right, no privacy right necessarily to stop um, pro augmented content from appearing as if it's on private land per se. Now there, there are certain circumstances where it could be an issue. I don't, I, I don't see it as a privacy right or a First Amendment right. I see it, uh, the, the primary danger that, we've, that the courts have explored so far is one of trespass and nuisance, which is not to say that put it, putting augmented content on private land is a trespass because it's not really there. That to me is critical on, on that question. Um, but it's, it, are you by, by it, it, it's, an, it's a map to me. It, again, it doesn't exist, and probably exists on your phone. It, it is to me a three dimensional map that happens to depict something on that land. Um, but is it, does it encourage people to physically invade that land? Uh, and unfortunately, this is something Niantic is still dealing with. Um, all of the, the nuisance and trespass lawsuits that were filed soon after the game came out are actually still around. Uh, they were all consolidated in front of the federal court here in, in the Northern District of California. And just last month, and I haven't gotten around to writing a blog post about this yet, but um, just last month, the, the court refused to dismiss those. Um, and so we're going to get more litigation on the question of whether or not putting a pokey stop on, on or near someone's private property is trespass, either some sort of digital trespass or of, of uh, encourage, uh, aiding and abetting people trespassing on your, on your lot. That, that is still an, uh, an, an open question. In my mind, it's an unfortunate one, but it's, it's still out there. Well, let me raise a related... Just one more real quick. Oh, go. Um, in terms of the trespass, and I think this is where the statutory issues get really interesting, is when you have um, known trespassers on private property who are getting injured and are suing the property owner because of their injuries based upon a negligence standard. So under tort law, the, pr the homeowner arguably has a duty to protect these individuals who are getting injured on their property. When that uh, uh, triangle intersects, I do think we start to see the legislation that surrounds these issues because the statutes right now don't, and, and tort law really doesn't fairly allocate sort of the, the economics and the public policy issues in terms of protecting people and who's really responsible for that conduct. I, and the, the nuisance trespass cases don't touch that because we don't really have injured people in the same way that I'm hypothesizing. And that's where I think you really do start to see a momentum in terms of should we be regulating this behavior? What should it look like? Why should we? And having this conversation that we're having within our state legislatures. Yeah, it's a fair point. There is definitely circumstances where there needs to be regulation. Um, it's just, it's such a fact-based question. Just to round out the issue, I'd say too, and this is, this is uh, advice that I've given to clients, is that you, you also have to consider the, whether or not the speech has a commercial nature. Uh, and if so, there, there's, there's an open question, again, very fact-dependent, but uh, are you creating confusion under the Lanham Act, which is the federal statute that governs trademarks, false advertising, things of that nature? Are you creating confusion in, in the mind of those who see this content of whether or not that content is sponsored by the property owner or are somehow affiliated with the property owner uh, such that it would, it would create a cause of action under that law? So let me ask the a related question. So we're in this transition period. We're removing from AR and VR apps, which people have to actively download, and they've got limited audiences to having AR and VR in the browser itself, which is just, you just click on it, it appears. Where do we stand in the transition between private display and public display? If I, only a dozen people see it on my front yard, is that actionable? Does anyone have an opinion or know where we stand on that? I mean, does it require a thousand people to see it or just one before it, it's, you're invoking these? Uh, I, I mean, it, it's a violation. It's a question of damages uh, more than anything. Hmm. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, you're, okay. The license yes. you Oh, okay. Oh, thanks. Signaling okay, five minutes. I thought you were giving some sign language. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, do, I don't think the number, I mean, there are certain types of claims that require a certain amount of publicity, giving publicity to a, an issue, like giving publicity to, to, to a private fact. 
uh, which if you publish it to one or two or a few people, it's not a violation. It must be giving publicity to it. But uh, if a, there is a Lanham Act claim, there's a Lanham Act claim. There's no minimum threshold. It's just a matter of damages. I think one area where public-private distinction comes into play is in the copyright space um, because two of the rights that copyright protects are public display and public performance as opposed to a private one. Um, so th I think the argument that you're, you're posing uh, is particularly relevant there. It, is the display on my phone a private display or is it public because I have to go out into a public place in order to interact with that content? And, and that there's a comment in the audience that it's a licensing issue. I think, I think it is. There was um, uh, the, the British Museum in, in London had an app where you could go to uh, places in London and see overlays of historical photographs that they have in the museum, but overlaid on the actual physical place where they were taken. Um, and you know, it raises an interesting question, is that a public display? Because you have to be out in the public to do that. And if so, does the license that you got from the photographer 20, 50 years ago uh, cover that use? OK, great. Because we're short on time, I want to jump down to Kimberly and the question of government oversight. Is there any government oversight going on in the ARVR space? So there is, Milwaukee. Uh, I mean, we've talked about the states, but I, I think there's some other interesting bodies that we haven't talked about. Congress formed a reality caucus a year ago. Um, they haven't really done anything they've met, but Congress is thinking about these issues, and that's something that this industry should be paying attention to and following, because um, to the extent to which they ever get the wherewithal to do something, then there's more of a national standard than what we have right now, which is the states paying attention to it. Um, two other bodies that, that I think are going to be much more active in this space than the legislatures is the FTC. Um, and so the FTC in particular pays attention to what um, companies do with data. And that's a subject that is definitely um, in the forefront of the Federal Trade Commission's mindset. So what are you doing with the data that you're collecting about where people are, what they're doing, how, what they're engaging with, the data that you're selling, uh, GDPR, we were talking about that outside. So there's just a whole host of data issues that the Federal Trade Commission's gonna pay attention to. And another body that you know we don't talk much about but um, is starting to pay attention to these issues too is the consumer, the CPSC. So think about your Wii and you have a little wrist um, guard on your Wii remote so it doesn't fly across the room and hit someone in the face. Um, they pay attention to consumer safety issues but have started thinking about what are the consumer safety issues in VR and AR and they're doing a lot to learn about the technology and think about whether or not they have any oversight. And if they do, they can force a recall. There are substantial penalties. So there are agencies that have various pieces of jurisdiction separate and apart from what we've talked about on the legislative side of things. Yeah, that's a great point. Th that's the type of agency that will be setting the standards that are yet to be formed as to, for example, what kind of con what, what parameters do you need on your content before it's, uh, it has a risk of making people nauseous? Your 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 the headwear is going to have a lot of nausea issues and, and vision issues. So that sort of thing will will be more and more prominent. And Alexia and Ed, did you have any thoughts on what should be regulated? Well, the one thought, but also just before, another laws that do exist now to be careful about are there are three states already that have biometric law regulation of like the. The, if you're either hand scans, eye scans, or face geometry in your products, Texas, Illinois, and Washington have statutes that regulate that. So they all differ in their degree of bite and the, the penalties that they impose, but it's very important, which is why you'll have seen, for example, Google recently, when they ruled out their selfie app, it was not available for download in Illinois. Because Illinois has a of the three states, Illinois, Washington, and Texas, Illinois is the one which is the most prohibitive. So that's something very important. If you're rolling out an app that has any kind of biometric collection in it and you're doing it in those states, to brush up on the law and to know the kind of consent that they require you to get. Now, as to whether they should be regulated, my personal opinion is that this is a great chance for the industry to regulate from the bottom up. Like we saw a video game industry get together and make their own standards for ratings, this is a chance for the VR and AR industry to do the same. You see, I mean, when Congress is talking about Facebook, how little they know, 
these will be, or some of these people will be the same people who are regulating AR and VR and who will have never put a headset or never held up a phone to augment something in the real world. So this is a great chance for the industry to be proactive about it. Super, any final thoughts? Michael. Just one last thing in, the, um, in this area of regulation. It, a lot of these devices are looking at your eyeballs, looking at uh, you know, tracking some of your medical data or have the capability of doing that. So I think we're gonna, we'll, we'll be addressing that sometime in the future, whether there's HIPAA data being collected and, and then what happens to all of that. Can the click license override all that? Or is the click license subservient to that? That's my last question. Because some click licenses now click away your brain waves. Maybe. Um, <laughs> there are certain, I mean, you mean like, can you, can you have a click license to there are get licenses. rid of your HIPAA data? No, I'm asking, in some applications now, I'm clicking away my rights to my brain waves as mm. part of the AR and VR sure. app. Sure, sure. You mean you, there's consent. That's uh, informed consent? Yeah. So I would say the, the, the courts have been pushing back on giving a lot of enforcement even to click wrap. Um, you know, one court in particular has said that a reasonable consumer does not understand what a hyperlink is. If you were to say, click here to read the terms of service. So, and that's because uh, companies are putting so much in the terms of service. So, uh, so I would expect to see change coming from the courts really on the extent to which certain provisions are not enforced. And you know, I'd look for that in New York. Super. Time up. All right, well, please thank the panel.